hello there again. I thought it should be time to do some soldering. Now what I've got here is a transistor tester. This is a device that has like a small IC socket where you can plug in various stuff up to a device that has three pins. And this thing will find out what that is. And it will tell you like the capacity of something, it will tell you if it's a MOSFET, it will tell you if it's an NPN transistor, PNP transistor, a diode, the voltage of the diode, and so on and so forth. These things are awesome. Now sadly the first one I got broke uh, was a much simpler one, not as complex as this one. This one also has the possibility to measure frequency and can also output frequency. So you have like a very, very, very basic frequency generator for this thing. Now, the good thing is, they give you all the parts in an ESD safe bag, which is awesome because the first device that I got was just wrapped in bubble wrap, and yeah, that kind of sucks. Now, yeah, of course, you've got to assemble it. The other one was already assembled, but hey, that's not uh, an issue really. I mean, if you get, if you are a person who gets a transistor tester like this, you're probably going to be someone who knows how to solder and everything. First thing we see is the small SID. It would be nice if they had put that in its own bag and not just crammed it in them with all the other stuff. Since, yeah, you can already see some pins have been bent. Then we have the chip. That's just an Atmega uh, thingy. Like the regular Arduino Uno one. And let's see what else we've got in here. Well, we have a bunch of stuff. We have uh, also some ESD components, that's just a small diode. Um, yeah, just so I'm gonna go ahead and sort out most of the stuff, since there should be two ESD components. There's one. And there is the other one, just a small capacitor really. Should be more than that since there should be like a small, very small timer chip that goes here. It could be a 555. I don't know. Ah, oh, there it is. Yeah, I can actually solder that small, so that's not really of an issue. You just have to really, really look out with the polarity for these things because that can be a bit of a hassle. I'm just gonna lay those aside. Uh. Yeah, what else do we got? Well, we've got a various amount of uh, transistor look-alike things. Should be like five or so. Uh, this one just has four, apparently. Uh, there should be a fifth one somewhere. I haven't found it yet. Oh, got it. Um, yeah, these are like transistors, uh, NPN and PNT, PNP ones. But there also are some voltage regulators, so you've got to make sure you put those in the right socket where they should go, otherwise you could mess up some stuff really, really bad. We have a crystal for the uh, Arduino, since, well, it needs that, otherwise it can't operate. Then we have some electrolytic capacitors. And... Well, pretty much... A whole bunch of resistors. Yeah, it shouldn't be too easy to uh, get uh, those sorted since well, all you need is like a uh, resistor cold calculator. You can find those easily online, so meh. Just put in the value that it says on the board and you'll get the color code and then just put where they belong. Next up, small potentiometer. This one also has a clicky button if you press it down. Well, that's actually to switch on the device and uh, select stuff on it. Got some screws and some standoff mounts, which is really good since none of the other devices have that and you can easily short some stuff out if you have, it, uh, have the bottom exposed. So this just lifts up a little bit. And... Uh, yeah, I'm gonna lay those aside too. Oh, that got stuck. And we have a bunch of ceramic capacitors. Now these have a code on them. Usually, if they've done it right, the code that the uh, capacitor has should be on the board. And as we can see, yes, it does. It says stuff like 22, 104, and so on and so forth up there, so you don't have to look up another chart just to know where you would put the capacitors. 
we just got a regular IC socket here. Now this thing will only do like three pins total as you can tell. Luckily this time they have labeled it outside of the socket, so meaning if you plug this thing in, you actually know which sections do what. That's good. Other devices didn't have that. Screw mounts. Well, just the regular things where you can screw some cables into. Could be helpful for uh, like the frequency output and uh, the frequency input. We've got a small LED. That's a power LED. We've gotten some jumpers and some binding posts. That's just for the LCD. And the really nice thing, we have a barrel plug on this. We also have a 9V battery clip. That's if you want to run this thing off a 9V battery, which is also pretty good. But yeah, if you don't have a 9V battery at hand, you can just run it over 9V through this. It's literally the exact same. Yeah, you can even see the traces just going right directly to those. So, yeah. I think the first thing we should do is start with the resistors. Since, well, uh, yeah, the resistor is probably going to be the most annoying part, you have to, like, uh, watch a little bit out which ones are the correct ones, and you just need this huge table online, so you can actually know which resistors are actually what. Unless you actually know the uh, color code by head, which I don't. But uh, that's what you've got the internet for. Or another thing that would be good to start with would be all the SD components, and those are a bit, well, nasty. And, uh, yeah, you don't really want to drop those, because if you will drop those, I can tell you by 100% sure about this, you will never find them again. You maybe find the diode again, but I doubt you find the small chip and the capacitor again. Because, yeah, <laughs> just no way. No way at all. When it comes to soldering uh, small SMB stuff, like the uh, diode, actually that's a uh, two-way diode, that's uh, actually a diac, not a diode, I was wrong about that. The capacitor and the small uh, chip. It's always good to have some of these uh, pliers, or well, tweezers, that uh, hold themselves shut so you can keep the components in on there and solder like that. Also make it, makes it a lot easier if you want to apply the solder first and then solder it to the board, which is what I usually do. Alright, let's start with the uh, diac. As you can see, it's in this small plastic package. Now be careful how you open these, don't just rip the foil off because the component will fly out and uh, yeah, you're going to drop it and therefore lose it. Best just use the uh, tweezers to peel back the packaging. Or if you have a knife, use that and hold on to the component while you pull the plastic off. And let's get it out of there and have a closer look at it. Alright. The way I mostly do this is I apply some solder to the pads and I apply some solder to the component. That's also why it's good to have these uh, small uh, tweezers so it holds this and doesn't get stuck to the uh, soldering iron. And it's always good to have some very, very thin solder. In my case, I'm using 0.56 millimeters. That's almost super thin. There's thinner solder, but this kind of seems to be my favorite since you, you have a really bad time applying too much with this, which is uh, actually pretty good. And that's exactly what you want. You don't want like a huge blob of solder on there. You just want like a very little bit. Exactly, not more than that. The rest, I mean, is happening on the board itself, so yeah. I 
and I'll just like lay the component with its exposed edge with that on the pad, heat of the pad, and it should stick to it almost immediately. Like so. I'm not really centered. Center it properly. There we go. It's one side done. Let's do the other side. Apply some pressure on the top so it gets it gets a chance to lay down. All right, that should do. Maybe I'll clean up the other side because there's like a little bit too much on there. All right, that's the first component. Let's go over to the uh, capacitor. Now, since this one's a lot smaller, you be even more careful how you open the package because if this you lose this thing, you're never going to find it again as well. Just gonna do like the same system that I did before. Apply some solder to the component itself and some to the pads of the board. Now as you can tell this thing is really 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 small, so small that my camera barely focuses on it, but yeah, there you go. But it will get a lot worse well later when we when I have to solder in the chip. Maybe I should have done that at first because now I've got all the big components blocking the way. Damn it. Probably should use a soldering iron that has a finer tip than that one because, yeah. It's a little big. Well, let's try this, anyways. Right, one side is on. Let's do the other, and then heat up the pads after each other so it doesn't like tombstone, which is doing it right now. Or that. So small, actually, my tweezers can barely grab onto it. But I got it. That should do. Alright, time to do the small chip. I'm gonna start with the pads at first. And clean up the soldering iron every time in between because you really don't want too much on there. Alright, let's get the small chip out of its package and continue soldering. Yay! Apply some solder to all the pins. Now it's kind of hard to make out of what exactly on this thing is pin 1. Since well, it's so small and doesn't like have a really like clear indentation for that, but it has got a small dot right there. Not sure you're probably not gonna be able to see that, but it has a very very small dot right there. So that presumably should be pin one. But I'm gonna check the data sheet just to make sure on this thing, because I really really don't want to put this thing in the wrong way around. Alright, I checked, and yes, that is pin 1. So, well, what is this thing? This thing is a Semtech Low capaci Capacitance TVS Diode Array. So, it's like a combination of multiple diodes in one box. Uh, yeah. Pretty much it. Yeah. <laughs> Not, nothing too, like, really, really complicated. Alright, let's get this thing soldered in.
Alright, the best way to do this is start off with one of the pins on the edge and then try to get it to stick on the other side. Currently you see my alignment isn't as good, so I'm going to try that again. Since, well, I'm currently shorting out all of the pads. But it needs a little bit of fiddling. And there we go. Now just to solder all the other pins onto there. Alright, that's on there good. Seems to have connection on all its pins. So, yeah. Of course, uh, you could double check this by, well, just hooking it up uh, to a multimeter and just probing the resistance or just doing the continuity test. It just beeps and then just check the pad and the pin on the chip. And that should beep if everything is right. We'll probably do that, just to make sure. Alright, that's all the SMD components on this thing. That wasn't too bad, it's you know, a lot worse in terms of SMD soldering than this. But, yeah, I think I'm not gonna move over to the uh, resistors, because, well, uh, there are a lot of resistors on here and it's probably just gonna be annoying. Well, yeah, just like read the value that's on here, put that into a uh, resistance uh, ring calculator identifier, and you're good. It's that easy, and I'm just gonna do a jump cut until I've got all the resistors in here. So, yeah, see ya in a bit. Alright, so that's all of the resistors, and I kind of skipped those because, well, yeah, I mean, you know how to solder in resistors. Look up the value, stick them through the holes. Bend over the pins, solder them on, and snip those off. Yeah, probably like the easiest thing to do. Alright, let's move over to the capacitors since, well, they are a little bit more annoying. But, well, not as annoying as the resistors at least. And since most of them are like the same, yeah, there's not like a lot you can mess up on those. Alright, so for these ceramic capacitors, well, the thing you have to look out for is, well, they have a number on them. Because, well, of course, they have different capacities and they need to be identified. So, in this case, this capacitor here has got a small 104 on there. So, we just match that with the board where it says 104. Stick that in there. Bend over the leads on the bottom a little bit. And there we go. Now just do it with all of the rest. Alright, that's all the capacitors installed. Well, time to solder them in. Alright, that's all of them soldered in. Check the bottom to see if the solder is through and through, and yes, it does. So, well, time to do what people like to do most favorite. Snip off all of the component lengths. Now these are too short to actually like reuse, so I'm just gonna throw those in the trash. Otherwise, if you have some like long component legs, it's probably always best to keep a bunch of these around, since they are like really good for like making some small bridges or modifications on some devices. Or well, just use them on breadboards. Make the whole thing look a bit neater. those two sides so you don't have them shorting out the board on the bottom. Alright, what should we do next? Well, I'd say we do the crystal next. There we go. Now one thing that I usually don't like is, well, uh, the crystals usually have a full metal body. They have like a very very small section on the bottom that's uh, either epoxy or it's rubber. That's what insulates the pins that going are going in and out. But the problem is, if the pads are too big on the board, well, you could easily short the entire thing out and the whole thing wouldn't work. So I kind of always like to have a spacer between that, they didn't provide one, but hey, those pads are like really tiny, so we should be okay.
So, that's the crystal installed. Uh, what to do next? Well, we could take our LED and do that. Now, the short leg on the LED is the negative pin. So, yeah, just plug that in the right way around. But the really nice thing that they also did is, well, usually an LED has a small cutout on one side in order to identify the negative leg, which this one has. But it's not really well visible because, well, the LED is so small. It's on the shorter leg. Up there you can see it has a flat surface and on the other side it has a round surface. The round is the positive, the flat surface is the negative. So, well, we just gotta stick our LED in here. Flat surface pointing towards flat surface or the flat section on the board pointing towards the shorter leg, which is, again, the negative. So, what should we do next? Well, let's move on to the transistors and power regulators. Now, again, uh, since they have a very similar package, you can easily mix those up. So, you have to make sure that the uh, component has the proper number written on top. This one here... Kind of not really readable, there's some drawing on there. But that is a TL431A, and that's that one there. So, and if you're sure that that is the proper component, well, you've got to bend the leg in the middle a bit outward, otherwise it won't fit. And then, well, just stick it in the board. And then, well, do the same thing for all the other ones. This here is a 9014, so again, we search the board, or we see 9014, and there it is. Also make sure that you have the curved side pointing towards the curved side, and the flat side of the component pointing towards the flat side, otherwise you mess up the polarity on this thing, and you could uh, either break it or cause some other stuff to break. Or just to have it like not function at all. In the best case, usually it breaks. So, how about some more capacitors? We have two electrolytic capacitors. There we go. Now, those again, the shorter leg is the negative one, but they also got a nice indentation on which side is the negative. So, well, first of all, check where we have them, and since they're both on the same capacity, you don't have to, like, really worry about it. Just make sure you stick them in the right way around. They have the positive mark of a small plus, so that's where you stick the longer leg in, and the negative is just a half circle that's fully colored. Alright, before we move on to this uh, socket, how about we solder in the uh, socket for the chip? Really don't like that they taped it together, they could have just used some ESD safe foam. Since, well, I mean, they already used an ESD safe packaging for everything, why not use ESD safe stuff for this? And just, yeah, this is just not nice. Since the tape they use is also not like, you know, ESD safe, but oh well. It's just an Arduino. Alright, the socket has a small notch on one side, as you can see here, and it's flat on the other side. Match that up with the silk screen, and you should be good to go. Because, well, that's also how the chip will look. Since uh, there also has a notch there, and you want to be sure you plug it in the right way around. Plugging this chip in the wrong way around, well, yeah, wouldn't be too great, would it? Now what I like to do is to like one pin on that side and one pin on this side, so you can uh, like center this thing properly. Oh, 
on there like so. And since, as you can see, it's still at an angle, I can now heat up this pad. And press it in, into its correct position. Like so. There we go. That already looks a lot better. Not at an angle anymore. So, uh, let's solder the rest. Alright, socket is installed. I'm probably just gonna put the chip in right now because, well, yeah, I don't want to have this thing flying around all over the place and damage its pins. Now, first of all, make sure that the notch points toward the notch of this thing and that the notch on this thing also is visible on the silk screen, like so. Now, it could be that the chip won't fit immediately. As you can tell, the legs are too wide apart and I can't get it in there. So what we've got to do now, usually you have like a small, uh, well, pin bender, that's really how it's called, for these things, or I see socket, I see pin benders, I don't know. You can just, just lay them on a the board, grab them with your fingernails, and bend it all over a little bit, until the legs are straight. Like so. Maybe that already will fit. Don't know, usually it needs a lot of messing around. Well, that already fits. Perfect. There we are. Our Arduino is in there. It's pretty cool to see that this thing is powered with one Arduino. And it's an Uno that does like everything on this. But I mean, the screen is just like multiplexing, so eh, you just need three of those. And you have a bunch of other pins on the Arduino to use for all the rest. Well, it actually be interesting to see the code that's on these things, since, well, it's not, not that easy to read that out of this one. If anyone knows how well I can find the code for these devices, well, please let me know in the comments down below. Alright, how about we add our pin socket for the display? Like so. Now, a good thing to do would be add also the binding posts already, since, uh, well, you've got to put the display on, and it's usually just best to just assemble the whole thing, stick the uh, headers for the display in there, like so, and having the display actually like, sit level somewhere, and then just solder that directly, so yeah, just put those in already. But I'm not gonna do that right now, still so I've got some other stuff to sort of like these. Now on this just make sure that the open terminals point outwards. Other than that, well, there's nothing much to it. There we go. Those are really hard to get in there. time for this funky looking thing. Just make sure that the handle matches up with the handle and that's it. And do the same with the IC socket. Do one pin here, one pin there, then align it properly that it's flat on the board and not in an angle. Yeah, as you can see, it's not sitting properly on the board right now. So press against it from the bottom and heat up the pads. That's one. And that's two. And done. How about this thing? That's our power pl plug connector.
this thing can be a bit of an annoyance to get on there like properly. So it's best to solder in the positive pin first because well, you can also burn yourself if you do the others first. And I want to align it then like later properly because well we have some exposed metal right there and if you solder on this and hold it yeah you can burn yourself. But that looks already pretty good on there so I'm not gonna adjust it any further. Alright, before I'm going to do the potentiometer, I'm going to do the display, because, well, the potentiometer is higher than the display. So, yeah, pretty much makes sense. So, get two screws, stick them in the bottom, and get those. And just lightly screw those down. That's more than enough what we need now. You can tighten them up later. Alright, let's get our display, align it with the pin header that we plugged in. If it wants to. And there we go, now we can solder it and it's level. And exactly at the same at the proper angle as it should be. Alright, just make sure that the connections are all good. They are. And yeah, that's almost it. The thing missing now is the potentiometer, but it's just so that the screen well, not fun, I'm going to put in two of the other screws that hold the display in front. Alright, let's see if this thing fits. Usually, sometimes you need to adjust the uh, mounts on this thing, because as you can see, they are at an angle. And actually, all the pins are at an angle, like, properly straightened up. reason for that is, since they just threw everything into a bag, it's all stuff presses against each other, and it will bend the pins. Which is exactly the issue I'm having right now. Those do not fit. Just widen them. Let's try this again. Alright, that's almost it. I mean, we could already operate this thing just by using the barrel plug. But we are missing our 9 volt battery. Could have maybe added that a bit sooner because now it's a bit fiddly to get down to those contacts. But oh, what does matter? Red is positive, black is negative. Simple enough. Just stick the corresponding cable into the corresponding hole. Should do. So well, now we also have to, you know, like calibrate this thing. For that, we will need two of these, just some component snippings that you've bent to a circle because you have to short all of the pins together, and then later add a capacitor to the uh, whole thing. Just have to make another one. I don't have enough. And this is why it's pretty much good to keep those component snippings, because for things like this, you will need them. Now there is a calibration capacitor that they didn't include, but it just generally is a capacitor just bigger than 100 microfarads, so eh. Not something that's like hard to come by. I should still have the calibration capacitor from my old unit. So, well, there we go. This is 220 microfarad, so that should do for the calibration on this thing. Plug in the battery, 
press the button and see what it does. And of course it doesn't show anything well because uh, we haven't plugged anything in. Testing again, just gotta see how we get into the menu of this thing. There we go. Now, the frequency generator could be pretty neat, but the thing is that's a bit annoying is it only does these frequencies. You can like set a really, really specific one that you want. You have to use the ones that are provided, which, well, kind of sucks. I mean, you have a lot to choose from, so at least that's good. If I could only get back into the menu. Oh, just hold it down, alright. We can do a pulse width modulation on this thing, that's what the other uh, jack is for. This is the frequency output, that's pulse width modulation on this thing. Which is, that is actually pretty nice, just drive the MOSFET, so that's pretty good. And on the top, we can hook a frequency up to this thing and we'll display what frequency it is. So I'm currently just trying to find the self-test option, oh, there we go. For the self-test, as it says, we have to short all of our probes now. So, stick one in one and two. And two and three. Should detect that those are shorted. And uh, now we have to isolate them. It just means take them out again. And now we should actually just add a capacitor in there. There we go. It's showing the proper capacitance. I will show it. It is pretty bright for this thing. Alright, so the test is completed. Ah, I suppose we also can measure voltage. Which, well, oh no, it's just the uh, battery voltage. Alright. Because, I mean, uh, I'm not too sure because it just shows this V down here. It could be possible that you can also measure voltage with this thing. But I would kind of be concerned about doing that since, uh, yeah, you don't know up to watch val what value you can go. Now it doesn't want to go back anymore. Come on, go back. Yeah, not really responsive, so... Just remove the battery. Put in the battery again, and now it will just show no or un unknown or damaged part. Let's put in the capacitor to the test again. And that's exactly the capacitance this thing should have. You can take this thing off. And yeah, it also measures the ESR. You can do a lot of uh, measurements with this thing which is really nice since uh, well, I'm building an amplifier and I need to know if all of the MOSFETs and stuff I have are still functional. So... I've got a random transistor here. 
stick that in there. And measure it. If it, if it will do it, come on. There we go. There we go, exactly what it should be. So yeah, this is a really, really useful tool and I would recommend anyone who does like electronic hobby stuff to get one of these because I know everyone has the feel, yeah, we've got a drawer full of random junk and uh, most of the stuff you don't know what it is and if you don't want to just do all kinds of research online or for whatever reason the label has been worn off of the component you can use this in order to test it, and I mean you can test pretty much anything with it. it does even will do LEDs? It will do big as MOSFETs like this thing. This one's actually just so big I don't even have to close the. Uh... Never on this thing because well, it just presses so hard against the pins it just makes contact already. And there we go, that is a MOSFET. And we'll show the diode, the capacitance, and all the other information that you will need. So yeah, this section down here is for SMD components if you have some. But well, other than that, that's pretty much it. A very nice, well, soldering kit, if you want to practice some soldering. Which also is a tool that is super, super, super useful whenever you're doing random stuff with electronics. And hey, I mean, if you break it, well, or if it breaks, since the previous one I had did, you can get to keep the screen. Come on, it's not that bad. Oh well. Just a bit of annoyance when those things break. And well, since it's an Arduino, it is, it's pretty much... You, Pretty simple and straightforward to uh, work with. But I would really like to see the code that's on this thing. Alright, that was small, some small soldering for a very, very useful tool. One of the most useful tools I've actually ever had. So, yeah, thank you for watching and goodbye. Alright, so I was just thinking how about we do some small uh, frequency tests on this thing. As you can see, the screen is actually an RGB screen. You can adjust the uh, color on it. I just changed it to white at the moment. But uh, yeah, how about we just test the frequencies? I've got some of my component legs plugged into here, and I have got my oscilloscope here. Now it's the basic oscilloscope that I also did a video on uh, fixing, which had an issue with the negative 5 watt regulator. And this is well, as you can tell. Just like this 15 euro kit you can get online, it's the DSO 138. Some a very very basic oscilloscope, but I mean for stuff like this, it's totally fine to use. Now this whole thing is like a big fixing station, just so I have all of the stuff that I usually use all in one place, like soldering iron, power supplies. This empty slot should be for a frequency generator, like this one. Um, Unfortunately, this one was not a kit, this one was a whole fully assembled thing. Sadly, it arrived defective and the screen doesn't show anything but boxes, and yeah, that's actually it. The screen, either the screen is broken or the Arduino that powers this thing is broken. But I just don't get anything, I don't get anything on the outputs, I can't adjust anything, and I don't see anything on the screen. Oh well, hope I get my money back from eBay. But yeah, that's why I have this empty section on here, because it's still missing. And I'm getting a different one, which is a kit, which also make it a lot easier to build this. Then we have our oscilloscope and a desoldering station. Alright, so well, let's go into our frequency generator on this thing. Plug this oscilloscope into there. Whoops. And yeah, currently it's not like you know triggering properly. Also, maybe it's already too fast for it. I don't know. 
Let's try a different frequency. Alright, yeah, apparently it didn't like that. Uh, it was too fast for the oscilloscope to actually measure. Because if it gets too fast, it just ends up showing like all kinds of uh, junk and it, it it will not trigger properly anymore. Like this. It barely triggers on that and uh, we'll just do random stuff. Yeah, and the megahertz range, it, it just doesn't work. It, it just doesn't work at all. But if we go into the... Uh, Hertz range we can actually get it to trigger so I should have 2500 Hertz what does the scope say 2500 as well as this let's do 50 Hertz we have 50 Hertz in a square wave just like that And it shows us the frequency, peak-to-peak -peak voltage, and everything. Yeah. Pretty simple scope, but it works absolutely fine for this application. Measuring, like, very basic signals. I mean, you don't need a lot for this, but... Yeah, I mean, I'm most likely going to use this thing for, like, audio stuff. So, yeah, it's going to be pretty easy to find, like, audio traces or so.